My name is Mark Campbell. I'm an orthopedic surgeon from Phoenix, Arizona. Today we're going to perform a Arthrex Eye Balance Medial Unicompartmental Arthroplasty. We are going to be demonstrating a new tibial cutting guide. It's very unique. It's a disposable guide that uses patient-specific uh, slope and depth of resection and really simplifies this procedure to give a reproducible flexion extension space. And now if you look, we have very nice exposure uh, of our joint. We now take the disposable tibial cutting guide, and it's a two-part guide. We've got the guide itself, as well as a stylus that will help set our depth of resection as well as our slope uh, and match that to the patient's specific anatomy. Uh, so I will place it in the joint line and advance it between the tibia and femur. And once I can feel it go right past the tibia at that point, I rotate it 90 degrees. I pull forward and it catches on the posterior condyle of the uh, tibia. So now, in order to determine our varus valgus positioning, and uh, I drop a drop rod through the cutting guide, and, and then I'm trying to line this up and make it parallel with my marks I made on my anterior tibial crest. The last thing I need to do with the guide is just set my medial lateral position uh, and rotation. And I use this ruler that's in the set. There's also an uh, angel wing that can work as well. Um, I'm going to put this in the vertical cutting uh, slot and then from that determine my rotation and position. Now, one thing I do is I utilize the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle is where I'm going to be aiming. It's a, a patient-specific cutting guide, so to speak. Uh, I, I use an osteotome first just right on the bone just to make sure soft tissue attachments are released a bit so it doesn't tether my saw blade uh, during the saw cut. Uh, so that opens up a little area now that I can take uh, my ruler, I can actually set it in the vertical capture and set this uh, right up against the lateral aspect of the condyle. So it's sitting right up against the condyle right there. I know that's going to be my rotation and my position. So at this point, Depth of resection and slope has been determined uh, by my pin. Uh, my varus valgus has been determined by my drop rod and my rotation and medial lateral position uh, by my ruler. So everything's set. Uh, now we will place in uh, pins in order to hold it. Now I uh, will put a single pin in to start with. The pins themselves are actually uh, above the uh, level of resection. Uh, so it stabilizes that piece and we'll show you that there's a way you can actually get it out as well. Uh, so I'm also going to have a hinge pin in. Now the hinge pin uh, is very nice and that helps protect your saw blade. And there is actually a third pin. Now in order to get that one in, we're going to take our stylus. We actually bend it straight up. So what that does is it gets out of our way for our last pin and for our saw, saw cut, but at the same time helps maintain fantastic stability uh, of this cutting guide. So I'm going to put the last guide pin in. So now uh, we are set for uh, our saw cuts. We're going to start with our vertical saw cut. And again, because we line this up so well, this saw blade fits right up uh, against the lateral aspect of the medial condyle and fits right down into my slotted site. So you can see I've cut down, very nice positioning, and my pin right here has protected me from undercutting that. So once that's done, we can switch to our horizontal saw cut. Uh, one thing I will point out that even though it's captured, we do want to have a retractor protecting the MCL because uh, the blade can go past there, and we certainly don't want that. Uh, we are protected from the lateral side by this hinge pin. Now I am done with this uh, tibial guide. I can remove that, and actually, uh, if I remove it all together, depending on soft tissue attachments, it may actually uh, bring my bone out with it. And if you look, there's my cut, a very nice slope, depth of resection. Uh, there's a very nice cut, all came out in one. You see how that did that? The pins were uh, in the bone itself. And again, my uh, stylus was holding right in the back of the uh, tibia and is able to pull it all out. 
once we've made our tibial cut, uh, we have now developed a space. Uh, we need to know what that space is and make sure it is adequate. Uh, we have a adjustable spacer guide here, and this will help us measure that. We'll simply place the end into the space. And we have a laminar spreader that will help tension this to the correct side. Now, I will tell you, uh, this again is a measuring device, not a device meant to uh, uh, gap open the space. So we will manually lift open the space and then we gently will elevate it until it measures the correct space and you'll hear a click uh, and every click is uh, analogous to one millimeter of space. It's now tensioned in that spot and in this space it's nine millimeters. We want uh, a minimum of eight millimeter space here and a nine clearly is uh, right where we would like to, to be at. So. Once we have measured our flexion space, well, we take out the tensioner and we will extend the knee and we will now measure our resultant extension space. We again place this, the adjustable spacer block in, laminar spreader will place it and again we tension it to the same tension that you tension it to in uh, flexion. And when I do so, it has the same three clicks again. It happens to measure nine in this instance. Now, it's important to know they do not need to be the same, and they often are not the same. Uh, but this gives us our extension space at this point. So I'm going to put a distal femoral cutting guide in, and it's, it, it slides right over uh, the spacer block. And once that's into place, I can place a couple pins to help stabilize it. One thing you may notice is we want to make sure we're not extending or hyperextending the knee. We can look in the notch to clearly see there's no impingement, and so that's a good position for that cutting block. Once that's completed, I can take out my spacer and my cutting guide. Once the guides are out, you have better visualization. There may be a little bit of bone that needs to be continued to be cut, um, and that can easily be done uh, with this exposure. We will flex the knee back up in order to get back to our flexion space. So I'm going to use a posterior femoral cutting guide. This again slides over the slots in the, in the uh, uh, spacer block. And it sits down right on the flat distal femoral cut you made. Now, it's important that this fit flush to it. And the way that it will fit flush is a variance of flexion and extension. So I will flex and extend this until it sits flush on the distal femoral cut that we had made. And you can see through this window in the guide that is flush down on to the bone. And once it's in the correct spot, then we pin it into place. It is a slotted cutting guide. And uh, it is captured on the lateral side. The medial side, uh, you have a retractor protecting the MCL. So now we can remove our guide. And again, if we have to do uh, some freshen up uh, cut, we certainly can if we need to. And so now a very nice visualization. The cut's almost completed. There's just a little lateral bridge of bone that I will finish with the saw. Here's an 18 millimeter static spacer block. And I'm going to fit it in, and it fits absolutely perfectly with perfect tension. So our flexion space has been set. We will check our extension gap, and in this case, the block fits in perfectly. Now, I will say I no longer do this step. Uh, the reason I don't do this step is because it is so reproducible. If you have a fixed space and you cut a fixed amount, it is going to be that uh, total amount every time. Now it's just a matter of preparing and placing the femoral and tibial component. Uh, I am going to place on a 5 uh, to start with and do so, it just fits right in. Now, I can fit it, see it fit right there. One thing I want to do is, one, I want to feel into my notch. It's right perfectly centered on my condyle. Then, I'm going to take my Army Navy and look up top, because what I want to do, and it's hard on the video to see this, but I do have a couple millimeters of cut bone anterior to this, this guide. Now that's very important. You don't want oversize. Uh, you want a little bit of bone uh, to be remaining. So this five actually looks really good. 
Two things this guide uh, will require. One, you need to drill for your lug holes. The other, you will uh, use a saw blade to cut your chamfer cuts. Uh, always drill your lug holes first. And the reason for that is once you've made your chamfer cut, that piece of bone is missing and the, and the guide will not be as stable. So this is the most stable it can be. It's got a positive stop. You drill those two. Now you go to your chamfer cut. Chamfer cut is captured. The only area that it's open uh, is on the medial side. And again, a retractor will help protect that. Uh, it is uh, captured and blocked on the lateral side. And the other side of the guide keeps the blade from going in the tibia. So it's very, very safe and well protected. We can remove our pins. And our femoral preparation is now complete. Once uh, that has been completed, uh, we can go on to our tibia. We can look at sizing our uh, tibial side. Now, that ruler uh, will do the same thing on the tibia uh, that it did on the femur. And again, the sizing, so as you'll see, as I capture the back and pull out, in this case, it measured approximately a four. And again, this is an anterior posterior measurement. Uh, it, what's very important, you don't want to overhang immediately, but thankfully you can see that visually quite easily. So we'll now select our tibial preparation guide to correspond to the size that we measured. In this case, it was a four, uh, and we're going to see how that fits in there. Uh, I set it right up against the vertical wall, and so it's sitting right on the anterior cortex. And when I do that, there's two spikes that sit down into that tibial bone. I then take a freer elevator because I can feel around the side, and I can both visually see and I can feel that we are absolutely flush uh, with the cortex there. So this is a perfect size. It's perfect around uh, uh, the tibia. Uh, there's a single um, uh, pin that goes in. Now I hold this with a handle while it's pinning into place. So uh, our stability now is compromised those two uh, tines on the bottom of the guide and uh, this pin as well as I hold it uh, with my uh, handle as well. Once I've done that, uh, I am going to uh, punch for the Danforth keel punch. Uh, this has laser lines to tell you when you're uh, deep. I stabilize this with my hand and set it in. I then tap this down and uh, the video won't show up, but I can see those laser lines disappearing in the guide. So that is set down. Now while that keel punches in, we have the ultimate stability of this guide. So I keep it in there for the next step. I take my uh, lug drill and I sit it in the more medial slot and I drill it down. Uh, it's not 90 degrees down, it's got a little of an angle to it, and it's sitting nicely in that, so I know that is my uh, angle. At this point, I pull my keel punch out, and that uh, will allow me to see my other lug hole, which is exactly the same angle. So I strictly bring this straight out, put it straight in the other one, put it straight down uh, without any tension on the guides. So once our tibia and femur have been prepared, we're going to go on to cementing. When I cement, I place just enough cement on the bone itself to fill the lug holes and the uh, keel punch. Uh, I then place a light amount of cement on the undersurface of the tibial component, covering the cement pockets. Uh, if you'll notice, I put a, I'll put a light amount on posteriorly, but the way this goes in, uh, with you see the, the posterior-oriented lugs and the keel, uh, and using our initial impactor, uh, it actually catches the back and pushes the back down first. In doing so, any cement is forced forward to the front of the knee, making removal of the extra cement very simple. So we will set this in. And I set the keel hole right in place, and the lugs will fall right down in place. Now, it's up in front, but I'm going to set this again till that captures the posterior aspect of the rim of the tibial component. And once it's on there, I'll gently tap it. And what that does is that put the posterior back. Then I walk it forward a little more. And you can probably see, look at the front as it closes down as I come forward. What that also does will allow any cement to come out the front for easy removal. So our tibial component's now in place. I cement the femoral component, very similar technique as I did with the tibia. I start by placing cement into the lug holes on the femoral bone itself. I then coat the back side of the femoral component covering the cement pockets. I leave the lugs 
uh, free for visualization. Uh, the technique is such that the first thing you need to do is get the posterior lug lined up with your posterior lug hole. Once it's in that position, I gently extend the knee while the assistant is pulling the patella laterally. Once the patella is pulled out of the way, you can rotate the femoral component over and into place, and then you can flex it back down because the patella is no longer uh, uh, in the way. Uh, we have a uh, impactor that sits in line with the lug holes. We just gently impact it in. I generally will do a gentle anterior impactor and posture as well. Uh, in this case, uh, it's tending to be very easy with different levels of flexion extension to get your uh, extra cement out. At this point, we'll put a trial polyethylene in. I find that it's easy to gently tap this down from the anterior medial aspect until it sits right in. Once the polyethylene is in place, I can check my flexion extension. One thing you'll notice is very nice alignment between the components in the knee. Uh, flexion extension is very smooth. I get fully straight. And then I'm going to check my tension uh, in my medial compartment. I want a couple millimeters of play. If I feel it's a more play than I'd like, I can always put a bigger polyethylene in. This one here feels perfect just with the 8 millimeter poly. So once the cement is hardened and you want to put the real polyethylene in, uh, the trial polyethylene is removed very easily uh, using uh, this device. It fits into the hole on the uh, uh, trial polyethylene. You just flex up, pull straight out, nicely pulling that out. Uh, once this is done, you put in your real polyethylene. Once the real polyethylene is in, we, uh, we use a pulse lavage to copiously uh, irrigate the area. Uh, we close the retinacular opening, uh, my choice being ovicral. Uh, we use 3-0 uh, subcuticular monocryl under the skin. Uh, I use staples. Uh, some people uh, will use skin glue. Either one is fine.